Okay, uh, thanks for coming for this presentation. Uh, so this is on using K2 to save time marking and increase quality of student submissions. I tried to use a title that would attract people. <laughs> uh, I'll talk about the content as I get into it. Um, so this is being recorded, though it records my voice, but probably if you ask any questions, I might repeat the question to make sure it's properly uh, recorded. So uh, the main contents I'm going to cover, first I'll look at some general perspectives on student assessment, uh, a high level, more theoretical perspective. And then I'll go into a number of detailed examples from a particular course that I coordinate and teach. And then I'll wrap up with a conclusion. Now to clarify the scope of this presentation, uh, because there's so much I'm going to cover and I'm going to try to go quickly, uh, of course, uh, ask questions along the way and I'll answer them as we go along the way, but I'll have to move quickly so I can try to cover all the things there. But I will not explain how to create any of the things in K2. Uh, rather than that, there's going to be links uh, to documentation and videos on the how to create parts. What I'm going to focus on is first pedagogically why you might want to use these techniques and then secondly I will show you how they kind of work if you're using them uh, in class. Okay, so with that I'll start with uh, some perspectives, uh, general perspectives on the idea of student assessment. Now probably uh, most of you are familiar with uh, the idea that there's two types of student assessment. There's summative and there's formative. And you can think of summative assessments. Uh, here's an analogy that I like uh, from a garden. Like if you're growing flowers in a garden, summative assessment is like measuring the height of the flowers to see how they're doing. But then the formative assessment is the actual nurturing. You're watering it, giving it fertilizer to help them grow. So summative assessment is assessment that really measures how students are doing along the way. Whereas formative assessments are the things we do, that they are assessments, but they're designed in a way to actually be an important part of the learning process. Uh, most student work assignments actually have a mix of both. It's very rare that something is 100% summative or 100% formative, and I'll, go, I'll come back to this uh, throughout the presentation. Another uh, perspective of looking at student assessments are the stages of the assessment. And the first stage is evaluation. This is when students have submitted something, we actually read it to see what did they submit and we look through it. Uh, so it's also important to note that when we evaluate, we're not actually evaluating student learning, though we like to think so, we're evaluating their performance because it's a snapshot. The only way to evaluate learning, you have to do a before and an after. When you see an increase in performance, that's the real measure of learning. Um, now evaluation is always, if we're talking about assessment, evaluation is absolutely necessary. Then next is uh, grading, and grading is assigning a score to the work that we've evaluated. It's important to note that Grading is optional. You can do assessment without grading. And the third stage of student assessment is feedback. And that is after having done the evaluation, we give some comments to the students in response to what we evaluated. Um, there's lunch there. You want to pick that? Okay. <laughs> now, when we think about these two types, formative and summative, and the three stages of assessment, uh, it helps to understand different aspects. So looking at formative assessments in the first row, the evaluation is mainly to determine how well the students have understood the learning objectives. And a grade is optional. A grade is not always necessary. However, uh, if a grade is given, the grade itself is an incentive for students to take the assignment serious and to learn. And so I actually consider giving grades an important formative element in that it motivates students to put in the effort and learn. Uh, then feedback for formative assessment mainly focuses on affirming what they have learned uh, and correcting any mistakes and giving guidance for future learning. 
summative assessments, the evaluation mainly consists of comparing their performance against what is expected based on learning objectives of the course, and also comparing their performance with other students, with that of other students. Then the grading is always a required part of summative assessment. You, it's a measurement, so you're giving a number or a letter to that uh, measure. And feedback, for summative feedback, it's mainly focused on explaining and justifying the grade that has been given. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to this chart uh, throughout, but this is a way of thinking of the nature of the assessments uh, that we design. Now another aspect which is very practical and extremely important is considering the time involved and from a teacher's perspective. Uh, when we're designing assessments, there are some time challenges before we actually give students the, ass the assignment. The first aspect is designing the assignment. We have to, whether it's something we create from scratch or we modify it from someone else, it takes time to design an ass assignment that is aligned to what we're doing in the course. Then next, we have to design an assessment strategy. So we want the students to do something. How will we assess their performance or, or learning uh, through what we did. And one thing to note is that uh, investing time to carefully think about the assessment can really pay off later on in the later stages, uh, as uh, I'll demonstrate throughout this presentation. Now, one thing I'll note here in uh, the assessment strategy, and this is something that I've not always done, but I try to do more and more, is the idea of sharing with the students the assessment strategy. That is how we're going to assess their work. I consider now very important uh, because that in itself is formative. When we tell students how we're going to assess them, they learn from that and that uh, helps them to produce higher quality work. Uh, that makes them more satisfied because they feel the expectations are clearer. Uh, it makes us more fulfilled because the quality of what students submit is better, it makes us more fulfilled. We're actually doing a good job teaching them. And practically, marking is much faster because it's much faster to mark high quality submissions than it is bad quality ones. And usually, the submission is more structured according to our expectations, and that makes it faster as well. Then after the assignment, so after the students have submitted the work, and now we have to do the other parts of the assessment, the challenges are first for evaluation. A lot of types of evaluation scales linearly. You have 10 students, it takes maybe one hour. You have 100 students, it takes 10 hours. Um, so group work, by having students uh, do work in groups, can cut the time by three or four or five. But other ways to save time are, one, automatic grading techniques. There are techniques to automatically do the grading so that time is reduced to almost zero. And another way of saving time is to rethink our assessments formatively, to design formative assessments. A lot of formative assessments save a lot of time in the evaluation, and I'll give illustrations. Then the grading part, of the time investment afterwards is pretty much built into the evaluation or feedback. Then the feedback, that is we give students the comments. There's a lot of issues, challenges similar to evaluation that it scales with the number of students. Uh, but if we can give instant feedback, uh, automatic uh, feedback takes almost no time. But instant feedback, as in we teach them something, we give them an assessment, they get a, their responses right away this is like the holy grail of formative assessment because this causes the greatest amount of learning. So if we can think of ways to incorporate instant feedback, that greatly helps the, the process. Uh, another aspect of thinking of the time investment is some feedback types are very repetitive. We're giving the same feedback over and over again. So if we can think of ways to kind of scale that, that we give the same feedback to all students at once, uh, that can save a lot of time. And the big issue is that personalized feedback, when we, each student does not give exactly the same response, but if we can personalize the feedback to each student, that is the most valuable, but it's the most time consuming. So I'm presenting time challenges because ultimately, um, 
the ideal assessment strategy, if we want to maximize the feedback, especially the formative feedback we're giving the students, but we want to minimize the time investment because we're limited uh, with time and the more time it takes, the fewer students we can give that feedback to. So this is kind of our challenge uh, where we're, we're going with. So I'm going to present a number of techniques to kind of meet these challenges, balance high quality feedback uh, and assessments with minimizing our time investment. But one of the techniques, uh, one of my key techniques are grading rubrics. And uh, some of you might know about rubrics, uh, but uh, if you don't, the one on the the one on your right, the writing rubric, is a more standard classical form of rubric. And the idea of a rubric is on the columns, you have the criteria. So the one on the right, the writing rubric is for a writing assignment, like an essay. So on the rows are the different criteria. Here are logic and organization, uh, the language that's used, spelling and grammar, development of ideas. Then in the columns are the different uh, levels of quality of work. So the first row, I'm sorry, the first column is unacceptable work and the teacher specifies uh, what is unacceptable about each of those criteria, then acceptable, then target, and exemplary. Uh, this is uh, the standard classic way of doing a rubric. Uh, however, I find it personally difficult to specify all the possible different levels of imperfect work. So I tend to always use a rubric more like the one on your left, which is um, a much simpler view. On the, on the uh, rows, what you pretty much have as criteria and performance are the same details you have in the exemplary category. So you just specify what is an exemplary uh, submission, but in detail. What are the things that a, a excellent submission would look like and specifying in detail. Then the, the columns are simply needs improvement, fair, good, or excellent. And so without going into more detail of that, here's what's exemplary, then the columns determine and you give a score to each one. So that's the basic idea of a rubric. Uh, there's a link at the bottom that gives much more detail about rubrics, talks about their advantages and their disadvantages. Uh, but uh, I find this a major time saver, and as we go through, I'm going to, uh, uh, we'll see that in more detail. Okay, any questions or comments at this point? Okay, so now I'm going to go into some uh, practical examples, and these all come from uh, the course on management of information systems in the digital age. This is a course that I'm the coordinator for on uh, the international schema campuses. And I'm, I also teach, uh, so I, uh, I do both. And this is in the Pageier M1 level. So these are uh, back plus four level students. I'm going to look at different kinds of student assignments and I kind of selected them based on their different assessment uh, properties. Uh, so I'll go into each one and kind of talk about some of the issues, the assessment uh, targets in those classes and the techniques that I use for them. Uh, the first one is an in-class write, submit, and discuss exercise. Okay. So here, uh, this exercise is uh, called the ATM activity. I, I got it from uh, a published source. And on the bottom here, it says, uh, on the bottom left, consider the automated teller machine, and that's the assignment. So it basically has five questions, and so in class, I present to these students, and the goal of the assignment is to get them thinking about information technology, uh, but from the people side uh, of it. So there's five questions, and they know what an ATM is, so tell them to think about it. Then they have to individually, on their own, they can use the web or anything, but on their own, they have 20 minutes to answer these five questions. And on the right, the submission instructions, I tell them exactly how to uh, submit it uh, in there. And then after the submission, uh, they submit it on K2 with a rubric, and then there's a class discussion. So let me show you uh, just very quickly. So this is, uh, no, not this one. So yes, so this here is a student's uh, profile. And so 
this is what they have in their K2. Uh, here's the ATM exercise. The student clicks on it. And, okay. So here, actually, I, I forgot to change the, the due date. Uh, what I do in class, I actually uh, open it up in class. So this is a student view, but from, uh, see I have so many windows open here. So this is my teacher view. So what I do in class, I go to the assignment, this is the ATM exercise, and then I would go to edit the settings of the assignments. And I disable the due date, and I save and display it. And now that it's, there's no due date, so I come back to the student view here, the student refreshes, and now it's open, and the student can add their submission. Then I use uh, a timer. Let me open that up there. So this is one I like, it's called Hourglass on Windows, 20 minutes, and I put that on the screen. So on the screen, I have the instructions, and then I have the timer, the countdown timer. And then the students have 20 minutes to work on this. And during the 20 minutes, I'm walking among the students, answering their questions, clarifying anything. Uh, it's actually helpful to look at their responses, give them a comment, have an idea where the students are going with it. So it's 20 minutes are active for me, though it's relatively silent, because I ask the students to work individually uh, on this. Then when their 20 minutes are up, okay, so a student, uh, here's uh, like a sample what a student might do. So the students, they type their responses into K2 here, they save the changes, and that's their submission. And they can edit it up to when it's, uh, the time is up. Then when the time is up, So when the time is up, I go back to edit settings, and then I enable the due date so that now time is up, save and display, okay. Yes. I could set the time in advance. Yeah. In practice, 20 minutes, time up. Oh, please, 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 one more minute, one more minute. Hey, just, just one more minute, one more minute. Okay, okay, one more minute, okay. And then, so I, I found from experience it's better to do it dynamically. If it's an in-class assignment. So that's why you did that way. That's right, because there's always little leeways and things like that, so, okay. So then when, um, so then once they've submitted in class, then I now do a class discussion for about 30 minutes on the answers. We talk about the answers together. So the evaluation, I'll actually come back to the evaluation uh, in a moment, how I actually do the marking, okay? But then the grading is just 1% of their total course grade. So very low stakes. And actually, if you do something like this, grading is optional because this is a formative assessment. And the main reason I have, uh, you have to know your student audience. If it's a very motivated student audience, there's no need for a grade. They'll do the activity, they take it seriously, you do the discussion. Uh, the learning comes from uh, the discussion, the, the feedback, the class discussion. And one key issue is that a lot of times if you try to have class discussion, you ask questions, no one answers. Well, here, they've just spent 20 minutes talking about the exercise. They, have, they all have something to say. So you know that it's not that they don't have something to say. It might be they're shy. So walking around, I know that some students have said something, and I might call them by name 
or at least call them, you said something really interesting. And when you say that, you said something very interesting, it motivates them to speak up because we've affirmed what they said. So there's actually quite a, a lively discussion for about 30 minutes, and the discussion is the feedback, is their learning uh, from what they have. So it's, it's a class uh, feedback, not individualized. Then finally, when it comes to after the class, you have to mark this. And I'll show you literally how I mark this. So after class, and this is just 10, but you have a class of 40 students or 100 students, and you have to mark each one. Well, knowing that this, th the nature of this uh, here, so I go here, so grade, I start grading the first one. So the first one here, Okay, so this is the rubric, and the rubric here is very simple. One criterion, they thoughtfully, appropriately, thoroughly answer the questions. Satisfactory, unsatisfactory, or unacceptable response. Here, I just click plus, 309 words, I go through, yeah, it seems like they said something meaningful, satisfactory, next. Okay, save and continue, okay, next. Okay, then uh, next one, okay, yeah. No, uh, okay. It seems like it's okay, satisfactory, next. Okay. The next one, 59 words only. When it's only 59 words, then I actually read it. I say, okay, what did they say? Did they really get to the point here? Then after reading it, I said, they, they barely talked about anything meaningful. Okay, this one's unsatisfactory. It comes out automatically. It's automatically counted. And so here, whenever I don't give anyone full points, I always give feedback. Uh, it's very important. Because now, the ones that you gave full points, the feedback is right here. Satisfactory, answered well with careful consideration. But, and the class discussion is a primary feedback. So the students have got feedback from class discussion. And this is actually just summative. It's just explaining the grade. So here I have to explain. Uh, you didn't answer any question in depth. So this is really just explaining why they didn't get full points. And then, there you go. So save and continue. And I go on that way. Okay. And one little side effect of this also is if a student is absent from class, this is one way of taking attendance. They get a zero because, you know, they didn't submit anything in class. Okay. So this assessment is very high on the formative assessment, uh, is very low on summative assessment, just 1% of their course grade. And the time and effort in marking, like I showed you, is minimal. So this is something that can uh, scale quite well. Yes. So I've got two questions for you because okay. I'm really Okay, the question type in K2, there's all kinds of question types. In this presentation, I'm going to go to different types. Yeah, one Th this one is uh, it's just text, so it's whatever you want. They just enter text as you want. I'm going to show you different question types as we go on. Then the second thing is, like, I'm, I, as far as I know, you probably have to do a manipulation to get your rubric, like this, and okay. you know, I'm yes. I'd like to know. I mean, obviously, maybe not now, Okay. Okay, so, so as I said, in this, I don't have time to show you how to do the rubric, but on the next slide, I have links that do. So, and I have this for all the things I present here. So here's, now it's important to note that K2, the technology underlying K2 is called Moodle. Uh, it's very important to know that because all, Moodle is the number one learn management system in the world and there's tons and tons of information on it. But here's some specific links, some from uh, official Moodle information, a quick introduction to the assignment activity, uh, and then Moodle rubrics, there's official documentation. And I've actually prepared some videos, actually based on this class, showing how to create a rubric and uh, showing how to mark an assignment with rubrics, okay? All right. Okay, now the next assignment, okay, I have to move more quickly here. 
is a technical assignment. Here, here you have some clear right or wrong. Okay? The first one is essay is more subjective, but here there is clear right and wrong, and that has some uh, characteristics. So in this one, we, have, we ask the students to create a business intelligence dashboard using Microsoft Excel pivot tables. And we show them a picture, which you have on the bottom left here, of an online sales uh, dashboard. And they have to reproduce this in Excel with the exact same numbers and with the same visual uh, features and shapes and all that. So that's their assignment. So this assignment is divided into two parts. There's an individual submission and a group submission. The students work on the dashboard in groups, but when they submit, there's an individual part and a group part. It could have been all done group, but uh, I like to, whenever I can do something individual, even in a group assignment, I like to do that so that there's a bit of differentiation. Um, so that's uh, how this one is, is set up. So just to show you, okay, so this is, now the individual part, and now the dividing the individual part, actually, even though this is mainly a technical thing, there are some aspects of it that are very black and white, right and wrong, and there are some aspects that are more subjective. So what I did is I divided the nature of the assignment into those two parts. So for the individual part, here the students, uh, I'm going to show you a preview. I use uh, a quiz in K2. And with the quiz, the students have to fill in these hidden numbers. So what is the number here? So I've already filled this in from a previous uh, round. They have to fill in the numbers. What is this number here? What's that number there? Then what's that number here? So they have to fill in the exact numbers. And K2 marks it automatically as right or wrong. And you can give a little leeway, like plus or minus two is counted correct, rounding off, and so on. Yes? Does it, um, so I used to do something like that when I did like maths. And okay. Okay. Because you put a capital letter and they weren't expecting a capital letter. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so very good. So when you do automatically graded quizzes, there are things like you put the decimal point instead of that. And uh, K2 is actually very good with that, that uh, you can set, uh, does case matter? And you can have, there's five different options. If you know there's five different ways, they could write CM or centimeter. You accept those as two, those alternate correct options. Uh, one of the great things is we cannot imagine all the other things, and students do typos and so on. So after the fact, you can add in. And so for me, whenever you do automatic marking, that's why I say it does not take zero time. You need to always review it, especially review the wrong answers, and see if there's any that you can give partial credit or it's just a typo, you give full credit and you don't have to think of it in advance, you just respond to what students have said, and you remark it automatically. So that's, uh, so it's very flexible in that way. Yes? Is it uh, still uh, impossible to import a question <coughs> from a Word file? Uh, it, it is possible to import questions. You have to follow the, the format, but in the documentation, I, the links, it gives more information. That, but I almost always import my multiple choice questions. I, yeah, I always do it by import. My okay. memories are good. In the past, we had to, to deal with each, each question separately. And you can enter them individually. Really time yeah, I don't. I import them. Okay. And so the links I give sh will include how to do that. So then the second part of this assignment is a group submission where they actually upload the Excel spreadsheet uh, that the group uh, has submitted. And so that here, they, um, they basically upload it. And from the, the teacher view, once they've done the submissions, so I set it up as groups so that one student submits and it applies to all the members of the groups. You have to set up the groups uh, in advance. Uh, and, but a nice thing that one student submits, all the other members of groups, they see the submission themselves so they can verify that, yeah, the person who was supposed to submit submitted the right file 
uh, that gives them the assurance. And for that, when it comes to grading, and also when you grade one student, you can apply the same grade to all the members of their group. So the rubric I use uh, for a technical assignment is uh, very particular. On the, uh, the roles are the different components of the assignment, the different question numbers. And so these are the, here's the different elements of the dashboard. And for each uh, maximum points, it says properly specified in every way and meets all requirements with no errors and nothing missing. In other words, perfect, not a single error, get maximum points. Then meets almost all requirements with only one or two minor errors. You lose a few points. Meets most requirements but one or two major errors. Uh, fails to, uh, to meet most important requirements and so on. So in this case, if the student is uh, perfect, then I don't give any comments. But any time it's less than perfect, then I specify what was uh, the issue here. And usually I have a separate file with comments that I just copy and paste because they repeat the comments over and uh, over again. But this greatly speeds up uh, the marking because the feedback is built in and you just specify on this part, here's the problem and so on. And actually, if you want to write comments on the document, you can upload that document back as part of their feedback as well. Okay, so this assignment is, um, as I said, it's divided into the objective part and the automatic part. And the grading here is 15% of the course grade. So it's relatively uh, high stakes for the students. Uh, the feedback I give them, now with the automatic grading, you can also have feedback there. So for specific wrong answers, you can prepare, if there's one you anticipate students give a lot, you can have feedback why that is wrong. And again, it's not even you anticipate, it's from experience. You teach a course one time, you review the answers, then you modify your feedback for next time, it, 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 it just builds in. So it's possible to give individualized feedback uh, with automatic grading. And then the group feedback is through the K2 rubrics. So this assignment is uh, relatively low in formative assessment. Uh, but it's very high in the summative assessment. And the time and effort in marking is moderate, but separating the objective parts that can be automatically graded from the more subjective parts saves a lot of time. And using the rubric saves time in marking the objective parts. Again, here's the links of the different aspects. Uh, there's the Moodle quiz activity for the automatic marking. There's the assignment activity to submit uh, the, the spreadsheet. Moodle rubrics for marking, and then links to Moodle groups, how to set up uh, groups in Moodle. Okay, is the time coming? Okay, so the next one is actually uh, a three-part assignment. So this is one three-hour session, and the, all of these things that I'm showing you have evolved over time. This is not like the first time I taught the course here, I had all these things. This course has been taught by different instructors. We've learned from each other. We've adapted things. And this is the current version. It's not perfect. There's still modifications to be made. Uh, but for this uh, assignment, uh, it is on business process reengineering which is, we used to teach that in two sessions, but now how do we teach that in one session? So, so here has been divided into like three assignments that the students do in a three hour session uh, with the goal of finally sub analyzing a business process and re-engineering it. Okay, so the first part is uh, we teach the students about how to analyze a business process and to identify different components of the business process. So this is more, you give them a process, do they know the different elements of it? So here we give them a travel uh, planning quotation. Uh, so this assignment on the bottom left, that's the assignment. So the students have to read that and then they have to break it down and analyze the different parts of the, uh, of the process. They work in groups, but they have to submit individually. And they have just 10 minutes uh, to do this, uh, which they answer in K2. So let me show you what that looks like. So here, okay, here's a preview. 
So here, so the first question is, who is the process owner? So they answer, okay, they give an answer. Then when does the process start? Okay, they check, okay, here's of all these different options. And nice thing, you can put as many options as you want, as many possible options, but when does the process start? When does the process end? Okay, they select when it ends. Then what information technologies are involved? So here they check, uh, they have to check all the right answers. A little technical note, with uh, K2 quizzes, if the student checks every single option, then they will always get all the answers right <laughs> when it's multiple options. <laughs> so a little technical thing that when there's multiple option things, I put negative marks, just tiny negative marks, so that if you check everything like this, your score will be zero. So, I w but I always warn them, because usually I don't like negative marks, but the way this one works, you have to do that so that students don't game the system. Uh, so they only get points for selecting the right ones and not the wrong ones. And so, uh, go through that. And then once they, and so again, 10 minute timer, countdown timer started, at the end of 10 minutes, uh, time up, they beg for one more minute, okay, one more minute and then uh, it's closed, and then automatically, then once the time is up, and you have to configure this in the quiz settings, then it will show the correct answers. Yes, this is correct, no, this is wrong, and here you have the feedback of why that's wrong. But uh, although they see this right away, I spend 10 minutes and in class I go over all the answers because it's important for them to understand why it was wrong so uh, they, they go over that. Uh, although they work in groups, I like to make this individual because the group might disagree. And so each student takes responsibility for their own answers. Okay. So that's the first part to give them, to help them understand the business process so that they can do the rest. Uh, so this is a tiny percent of the grade, it's 2% of the course grade. Uh, it's, uh, the feedback is automatic in K2, but also we talk in class, there's a class discussion for feedback. So it's very high informative assessment, uh, and the summative assessment, very low uh, score. The time and effort in marking is virtually zero. The only thing is afterwards I need to review it to make sure that the answers are correct and, uh, and all that, but it's almost uh, zero. And this uses a K2 quiz activity. Then the next step of this assignment is the business pro, uh, process reengineering. So this is uh, it's a kind of complex thing for the students to do. So I first have a practice assignment in class. And this practice assignment is it's not graded at all. So here they have to re-engineer this business process. In other words, uh, read the process, decompose it, so the same thing, identify the different process parts, and then uh, state what is the process, then find out the problems and redesign the process. So here I say the students must work individually and they do it on paper. And I give them 15 minutes. 15 minutes is not enough, but in a three hour class session I'm not able to give them more time. So give them as much time as they can. Uh, but they have to individually work on this on paper. Then at the end, once uh, the time is up, then we have a class discussion and go over uh, the solution. And actually, I've already prepared my solution, so I can go quickly. So about 15 minutes, we go through who are the different uh, decomposed process, which is the same thing as the first assignment. Then I present the step-by-step -step, uh, flow, and I present my solution. And then my solution, I actually, uh, it, I, it's already on K2, then now I unhide it, so they have my sample solution. So that's the second part. So this one, the evaluation, I don't evaluate them individually. It's just a class discussion. Again, it's good to walk around so that I have an idea of what's going on so, and I can give the immediate feedback that way. Uh, there's no grading at all. Uh, the feedback is a class discussion and also my model solution. Uh, so here, formative assessment is very high. It's purely a learning exercise. The summative assessment is none, because I don't actually evaluate anyone individually, and there's no time and effort in marking. Um, one comment. So when you, because you have all of the data of the students, do you ever, is there like a way to have a global vision on K2 
too. Like for example, if there's a question that most of the students got wrong. Yes. And then like. Uh, yeah, K two has all those analytics. Okay. It has. And you can do it like you know like uh, fairly easily so that you can. Do it instantly in class. Yeah. So that. Depends on how fast you are. Okay. <laughs> But it's all there. Once they've submitted, yeah, if you can quickly go to the section, glance through it, yes, you can. Yeah, because it would be yeah. interesting too, like, you know, rather than just giving them the solutions, asking the students who got it wrong. No, like no, no but this one, there's no submission. Why? This, as I said, they don't submit anything. It's just on paper. Okay. There's no submission. No. Yeah. So th that, that would not apply here. No, I don't take the papers. It's purely discussion, class activities, not graded. But then, right after, here's the real deal. Exactly the same structure, but a much more complex exercise. Uh, and I usually tell them, you first of all work on it for 15 minutes individually on your own. On paper or on the computer? On the computer. And then, <coughs> cheat, in what way? No, no, but I'm saying that. So first they work 15 minutes on their own, and then now you work as a group. It's a group assignment. But I require them, because the problem with groups, sometimes two or three people are doing all the work and one person's sitting there. So by, I, I try to say 15 minutes, you working on your own, so that when they start working as a group, everyone has thought about it, and everyone has ideas. But it's a group assignment. So yeah, it, it is a group assignment. And uh, they have an hour to do the real thing. Uh, but uh, so the advantages of that then are that I've already done a practice assignment, so they know what I'm looking for. I have a model solution. They know the structure I'm looking for. So when I actually mark it, it's much easier. It's structured uh, according to what I expect, so it's much faster for me to mark. Students are not way out there. Uh, then the rubric here that I use for this uh, and an assignment like this, you can have them submit it after class or at the end of the class session. Uh, one advantage of doing it, of still spending an hour, is because I walk around and I help them. I, I guide them. I make sure it's not just go out and do it. I make sure they're on the right track. So the rubric here is different because this is not a technical assignment. It's, there, it's fairly subjective. There are some technical components. Uh, so here on the the criteria, I specify an exemplary grade submission. Then the rows for the, uh, I'm sorry, the columns for the criteria, the maximum points, like the first row uh, for decomposing the, the process, maximum point is not for meeting the expectations. Maximum point is for exceeding expectations. If they only meet expectations, at most they get like 80% or 90% of the grade and then needs improvement, poor, and unacceptable, not done, zero. And this is another thing I learned from another professor. Uh, this is so that students, they don't just barely do the minimum and expect a great grade. <laughs> what does exceed expectations mean? That's up to us, okay? Uh, that, this gives us flexibility to differentiate students that just did what you, exactly what you said versus students that really did a great job. Uh, then when I give comments, I do not give comments in general for exceed expectations or meet expectations. So I don't have to justify why I didn't give you 100% on that criteria. Uh, it says you met expectations, okay, good. Uh, but whenever I give needs improvement or poor, I always give uh, detailed feedback why uh, you did not meet expectations. Now that doesn't stop you. A lot of times I do give comments for meet expectations or exceed expectations. You're free to do so, but you're not obligated. And the great thing is that students don't complain. Like, why did you say meet expectations, not ex exceed? Though one little thing also is that I avoid just meet expectations, meet expectations, everything. I try to at least give them exceed expectations on one point so that they know I'm not um, impossible. So at least the point on which they did the best, I'll at least put exceed expectations, and then I can balance it out uh, with the rest. Yes. Yeah. They may actually really benefit from a little bit of feedback. 
no, so, so, so realist. So the thing is, so feedback. Uh, in addition to general, to line by line, you can give general feedback, and you can give line by line. So it's up to us how much feedback we want to give. So I, I'm just saying that K2 gives the structure. Uh, definitely, the more feedback, the better for the students. But realistically, depending on how many assignments we're marking, uh, the point is that we have the flexibility. Okay. So uh, for this final, uh, this final part of the assignments, uh, the grading, uh, the evaluation is manual with a rubric. Uh, the grading is about 7.5% 7 of the course grade, so it's a moderate weight. Uh, the feedback is group feedback that I give in the K2 rubric comments. Uh, the formative assessment of this last step is low because I've just done two formative assessment exercises which greatly increase the quality. The summative assessment weight is moderate, and the time and effort in marking in this part is moderate in that you have to read the assignments, but again, because the students know what you're expecting, uh, they are, they, you've given them a model that gives them a structure. And, and one of the disadvantages of rubrics, uh, I have to say, that there's a link to an article that talked about advantages and disadvantages, one of the disadvantages is that it can stifle student creativity somewhat because then students only try to meet what the rubric says. But in practice, that really depends on how we design the rubric. If we design the rubric section one, section two, section three, you must structure like this, well, the students will fit that. But if it's really just like creativity, uh, cohesiveness, if we're the rubric items are global things that do not impose a structure, then it does not stifle creativity. So this is something we have to think about. And it's a learning process. We, we learn as we go on, we improve them as we go along. Okay, so these are links to Moodle that teach how to do the different components. Okay, the last uh, kind that I want to demonstrate is for in-class student presentations. So in this course, in the last tutorial session, uh, the students present, and it's pretty much cumulative for all the different components they've learned in the lectures and the tutorials. Uh, they have to do a case study of a company or a real uh, technology product, uh, and they present that. So in principle, rubric is similar here to that of a written assignment. Uh, the kind of things like here's the difference. Uh, so here's the aspects of the presentation, but it's tailored to a presentation, includes how you present, but also the content. So that aspect is very similar. Uh, but what is different or special about the group presentation is that the marking, the evaluation part of it, is probably 80% live. Because if we just say, okay, we watch all the presentations like all the other students, then we go back, and then now we have to get on the marks, we're going to forget most of the things. So we have to write down on the spot our immediate impressions, and then later on we come back and then we get uh, the final grade. So probably the easiest way to do this is to print out the rubric. Uh, so I designed a rubric based on what uh, I think is important for the students, but also based on, uh, it's, a, it, it's a guide, because I always give, like for this rubric, I give them to it's, uh, the first tutorial session in the class, like maybe two months before the presentation. Uh, and in addition, I give them a very detailed document explaining exactly what I, uh, I expect. So again, clear instructions are very important so formatively. Uh, so the practical, the easiest way is to just print out the rubric, one for each group, and then you write your comments live, then later you come back. Um, I actually like to enter the comments live in K2, uh, which, uh, which that is a little bit risky because you have to be careful of some things. Like one, you have to make sure you hide the grade because, uh, in fact, this semester I forgot again to hide the grade, so students were saying, why did we get only a 40? I said, hey, you're not, <laughs> supposed, you're not supposed to see that, it's not finished. Uh, so you have to hide the grade so that they don't see the grade uh, until you've uh, had the time to revise it. But I, I personally find it faster uh, to do that, but it's 
probably easier for most people. Just print out the rubric, write your comments, and then uh, in the end, uh, you reconcile everything. So this uh, particular project, so the evaluation has two steps. There's live in class, and then after class, you do the finalization. It's 30% of the course grade, so very high stakes. Um, the feedback, so here you give feedback. So yeah, here you really need to give feedback. And it's not just summative feedback explaining. You have to give formative feedback, because this is like now for the rest of their lives. Uh, so you give uh, more comments there, uh, but again, with the K2 rubrics. So this here, uh, the formative assessment is moderate because of all the instructions uh, we gave in advance. The summative assessment is very high, 30% of the grade. But the time and effort in marking, uh, if you've done class presentations, is very low compared to other assignments because you're doing most of the marking on the spot. Uh, so it's not much more time marking. It's much less time than for a written assignment that might actually weigh much less uh, in the course grade. Okay, and so here are links to uh, aspects of K2 or Moodle that uh, are used for that. Okay, so now to uh, conclude what I presented here, I want to go over some key takeaways. Uh, first is noting that both formative and summative assessments are needed for effective learning. Uh, summative assessment emphasizes measuring their performance and formative assessment emphasizes nurturing the learning. And ultimately, we tr we're trying to optimize in maximizing the quality of feedback, because that is the greatest learning opportunity for students, but minimizing the time effort, because our time is limited. And we want to be able to give more feedback and more quality feedback for more students. So by optimizing the time, we can achieve that better. Uh, so I covered a list of techniques to meet this goal. First of all, sharing the assessment criteria with students in advance is hugely formative. Uh, then there's many formative assessments. Uh, actually, I'm going to show a link to uh, a list of formative assessments to give ideas on how to build in high quality learning experiences. A lot of them with no marking required at all, but very high in learning quality. Um, automatic grading can really cut down the time uh, to almost zero as much as possible. Uh, grading rubrics build in feedback both before and after the assignment. Now some general tips for using K2 successfully. Um, first, I've already mentioned just knowing the fact that K2 is Moodle. So that means if you want to learn how to do something in K2, you just search the web for how to do it in Moodle. And there's going to be videos, there's going to be tutorials, there's tons of information. Uh, I, I was really, really happy a couple of years ago when I heard that Schema was switching to Moodle, because I knew then we're, we're good for now and many years in the future. Then extremely important, which unfortunately we take for granted a lot of times, always practice and test the IT in advance. Uh, because especially if you're going to use something live in class, you have to practice in advance because things rarely work as we expect. And uh, so K2 has a student view where we see what the student would see. And it doesn't show you 100%, but at least 90% of what the student would see. And that helps us prevent things, uh, misunderstandings. So always practice in advance. That's critical. Then uh, I like to tell people, so I'm someone, I'm a professor in IT. I'm a very advanced IT user. And that is why I do not trust IT. <laughs> so whenever you have an IT-based assignment, it's very important to have a low-tech backup plan because sometimes the Wi-Fi is not working, uh, the projector doesn't work. So uh, a lot of tech anxiety is because we're not prepared for things that don't happen. Uh, like even for this presentation I gave, uh, so yeah, Liz and Noen were here. I came in yesterday to test the technology, and uh, yes, I found something that was not working. We got to fix it. <laughs> and so uh, you have to have backup plans uh, be prepared in, in advance. And it's uh, having a paper-based backup, like 
if things don't work, you have paper, okay, you can go print copies, run to student office, print paper copies, they do a paper assignment. Just having that, even if nothing happens, really relieves a lot of tech anxiety. So I say that's uh, really important in designing any IT-based uh, plan. And even like using Kahoot, so when I use Kahoot for my uh, tutorials, I had, I had like some paper uh, ideas that, okay, if it doesn't work, they can raise your hands with colored paper. I didn't do it, but I was trying to prepare that. But just thinking of things like that leaves a lot of uh, issues. Then I mentioned here are some links that have several uh, examples of formative assessments. Uh, which we can, uh, and, and we can't do all of these, but there's probably one of them that we could design in maybe one or two sessions of our class. And students really appreciate these because it, it increases their learning, it breaks the cycle of just lecturing, 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 and uh, designing it into the course, evolving over time, uh, really does increase their learning.